Good morning. Welcome to Victoria's Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. I want to remind you again that tomorrow, October 7th, Saturday at 6.30 p.m., is our next Victoria's Faith service in the Denver Tech Center. And we'll be meeting again at the La Quinta Inn and Suites on the northeast corner of I-25 and Arapahoe Road. So come and join us tomorrow, tomorrow evening at 6.30 p.m., in the Denver Tech Center for our next service. You can go to my website at victoriousfaith.co. That's victorious like a champion, V-I-C-T-O-R-I-O-U-S, faith, F-A-I-T-H, dot C-O, C-O like Colorado. And go to the meeting schedule page there. You will see the details of time and location and the map. So come and join us tomorrow evening at 6.30 p.m. You'll be blessed. You'll be glad you came because you will hear a powerful message on the from the Word of God that will build your faith. Glory, glory to God. Now we're studying the lesson proofs that abundance is God's will. We are currently in Proof number four. Proof number four. Prosperity is in and part of our redemption. Prosperity, and you could say abundance, is in and part of our redemption. And I've been talking about redemption the last couple days. That the word redeem means to buy back again. Redemption is God paying the price to buy us back from Satan, sin, and the curse, and to restore man back to his original condition and position he was in before the fall. His original condition and position he was in before the fall. And so God, Jesus bought us with his own blood. What did he buy us with his blood on the cross? Glory to God to buy us back. Yesterday, I gave you scriptures where we see we were slaves to sin, Satan and the curse. We were slaves. Galatians four, eight. We were slaves to those who are by not nature, not gods. That is Satan. Number one, he is the God of this world, but he is not the true God. So slaves, we were slaves to Satan. We were slaves to sin, Romans 6, 16, 17, 18. And then we were slaves to the curse, Galatians 3, 13. And he bought us back and he made us free. Glory to God. And Galatians 4, 7, we are no longer slaves, but sons. Hallelujah. And so we see that we are no longer slaves. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just tell him thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for buying me back again from Satan's sin and the curse by your blood. Now, I shared with you yesterday that A lot of Christians, millions, probably most Christians only recognize redemption as spiritual, as the redemption of the spirit. Remember, I've given you nine areas of your life. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a physical body. So you are spirit, soul and body. Those are three areas. Then your finances is another area. Your family is another area. Then your work is another area. And your protection from danger is another area. Oh, all other relationships was another area. And then your future is another area. Nine areas. So when you are redeemed by the blood, it is not only your spirit. It, that is redeemed. It is not only your spirit that's born again and redeemed from Satan's sin and the curse. It is also your soul, mind, will, and emotions. You are redeemed from fear. You are redeemed from depression, anxiety, all mental and emotional torment. You are redeemed in your body. The curse is sickness and disease, weakness and pain in the body. You're redeemed from that and you get healing. You're redeemed in your finances. Poverty and lack, hunger is 
pot is death in the finances, the curse in finances, and then strife, anger, offense, bitterness, resentment. That's death in relationships, including your marriage and family. You are redeemed from death in your marriage relationship with your children. You're redeemed from that as well as all other relationships. You're redeemed from the toil of work that produces little. And now we will talk about later as we get to it, the blessing, which brings fruitfulness. You are redeemed from tra- tragic violence or or death by accidents or natural disasters because you have protection from danger by the blood of Jesus. And that's where I got diverted yesterday on yesterday's program talking about that area of protection because we've recently seen another tragic tragedy of violence in America. And I explained that the number one way God protects us from danger is by the leading of the Holy Spirit, by directions, by go here, go there. Don't go. Get out of here. Leave this place now or stay where you are. Don't go to that meeting. Don't go on that vacation. Cancel that appointment. Don't go there. Don't be in that place. And I believe because I know God, I know his Holy Spirit. I know his word. This is the way he works that every child of God that might have been in that place of tragedy. They had the Holy Spirit warnings. The problem is a lot of people don't recognize the Holy Spirit. They don't follow the Holy Spirit. They don't know the leadings of the Holy Spirit. And they just walk on through into danger and tragedy without taking heed to the warnings. And so I actually have two series on my website you should listen to. Of course, you should listen to all of them. But let me mention the series, How to Be Led by the Holy Spirit. How to be led. You can learn to be led by the Holy Spirit and it can save your life. It can keep you out of places of danger and the Holy Spirit leading you. Get out of there. Don't go there. Don't be in that. And that will protect you again and again. And also another series, how to live and not die. I taught that a year ago. Well, no, two years ago. I don't remember a long time ago. And how to live and not die series. I guess it was two years ago. And how to live and not die is another series that goes with how to be led by the Holy Spirit because the leading of the Holy Spirit in you, not by an audible voice most of the time. Occasionally he does speak audibly, but it's rare. Most of the time. Probably 99% of the time, it is by the witness, the promptings of the Holy Spirit in you, in you, in you, because that's where he lives. When you are born again, when you are a child of God washed in the blood, he lives in you. And that's then where he will give you the directions in you. You need to learn to follow them. It will save your life. He can teach you to prosper and increase. He can teach you how to walk in health and healing. He can teach you how to get your marriage restored, your children and your grandchildren restored. The Holy Spirit in you teaches you. And that is the the answer to a hundred to a thousand and one questions. Be led by the Holy Spirit. What should I do? Be led by the Holy Spirit. How do I work out this situation? Be led by the Holy Spirit. He's in you to teach you, but he will also guide you to safety and protect you from danger by telling you, get out of here. Don't be in this. Don't go to that. And if the children of God, born again, Christians would only heed and obey those promptings. 
they would be protected every time. The problem is most Christians, a lot of Christians ignore those promptings because they don't recognize it. They don't know they can follow the Holy Spirit. They don't know it is the Holy Spirit. They just go on blindly and dumbly into tragedies when they could be stopped if they would follow the Holy Spirit. So that is so important for you to learn to follow the Holy Spirit. Now, a couple days ago, I, I shared scriptures with you about your redemption from sin and the curse. I gave you redeemed from the curse. Galatians 313. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. So he redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. Now, he was made to be a curse. Now, second Corinthians five twenty one, second Corinthians five twenty one. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, for us, for us. You see, I did a lesson early on called the great exchange. This is all in our redemption. Our actually, I didn't call the lesson uh, the great exchange. I called it benefits of salvation or something like that, but it's the redemption that we have. It is the great exchange. It's where God took our sin and gave us his righteousness, took our sickness, gave us his healing, took our poverty, gave us his riches and wealth and glory, gave, took our despair, gave us his hope, took our punishment, gave us his, his his forgiveness and pardon took our curse, gave us his blessing. He went, Jesus went to hell so we could go to heaven. That was called the great exchange, the great exchange. He took your place. Jesus took your place so that everything he took your place for, you should never be experiencing it and living in it anymore. However, there is still the curse in the earth, it still exists in the earth. And so we must learn to walk in our redemption and our deliverance and our freedom. As we read yesterday, Galatians 5, 1, it is for freedom that Christ has made us free. He made you free in your spirit. He made you free in your soul. He made you free in your body from sickness, disease, and pain. And weakness, he made you free in your finances from lack and poverty. He made you free in your family from strife and anger. He made you free in all your relationships. He made you free in your work of your hands by removing the toil. He made you free in your protection from danger. He made you free in your hope for the future. He made you free in all nine areas. You are redeemed in all nine areas, but you must appropriate it by faith, each area by faith. And if you only believe, which millions of Christians only believe their spirit is redeemed, that's the only part they appropriate of their redemption. They only believe their spirit is redeemed. They're born again, going to heaven. And that's the only part that they take and appropriate in their lives. So they leave the others untouched, not appropriating it for your soul and your body and your finances and your family and your work and your future and your protection. You need to appropriate all the redemption in all nine areas by faith. And let's go back to the spiritual laws of the kingdom of God. And I've given you seven primary spiritual laws. Walking in those laws is how you appropriate every blessing, every pro provision of redemption, every provision of God in your redemption, everything the blood bought for you and took for you. Glory to God. Now, Back again to second Corinthians five twenty one. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He took your sin, gave you his 
righteousness. And then Matthew eight seventeen. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities. He took our, ours. He took ours, our what? Our infirmities, which includes weakness, sickness, and pain. The Hebrew definition of infirmity is sickness, weakness, and pain. So he took up our infirmities, sickness, weakness, and pain, and carried our diseases. All right. He took ours and first Peter 224, the last part of the verse by his stripes, you were healed. So he took your sickness, weakness, pain, and disease. And by the stripes he bore What was the purpose for the scourgings of the Roman soldiers? That was for your healing. The scourgings, the scourgings of the Roman soldiers on Jesus were for your healing. Because first Peter 224, by his stripes, you were healed by his stripes. You were healed. There's the great exchange. He took your sickness, disease, weakness, and pain, gave you healing, healing. And then also the great exchange in your finances. Second Corinthians eight, nine, second Corinthians eight, nine. It says, for, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich yet for your sakes, for you, for us. Remember all the for us scriptures. He did it for us. For your sakes, he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. There's the great exchange again in your finances. Great exchange for your finances. He became poor so that you could be rich. Now, there are ignorant Christians who try to argue every scripture about abundance and they'll try to say, oh, that's just spiritual poverty and spiritual riches. Wrong. You have to take it in context. This whole chapter and the next chapter, Paul is talking about an offering of money that was collected and how they gave the Macedonian church gave in Roman uh, second Corinthians eight two, the Macedonians out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. They gave as much as they were able. What spiritually? No, materially, financially, they gave as much as they were able even beyond their ability. And they pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. Take a note. It's a privilege to give. It's a privilege. Don't think it's an obligation and don't think you're doing God a favor or you're doing the church a favor Or you're doing the ministry you're giving to a favor. I'm doing you a favor. No, this says the privilege of sharing. It is a privilege to give to God and to the kingdom of God through the works of the churches and ministries. It's our privilege. Don't consider you're doing the church and the ministry a favor. It's your privilege to give, to share in the kingdom of God and in the work of God. Why? Because you're storing up treasure in heaven, which is not just on hold until you get there. We've talked about that before. It is for you to tap and to access whenever you have need. It is laying up store. It is It is depositing in your bank account so that you can make a withdrawal when you need it. So you can say, Lord, I gave on that occasion. Now you will supply my need in this occasion. It's because you have laid up ahead of time in your giving that you can expect God 
to meet your need when you have a need. You know, that's even what Philippians 4 19 Philippians 4 19 is all about which says and my God will shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus we read this last week glorious riches glorious wealth according to his glorious wealth he will supply your need but you know what you have to qualify for that verse you have to qualify for that promise just like you have to qualify for everything and through faith is one of them, but this is written to the Philippian church because they had given to Paul Philippians chapter four. Well, the whole book of Philippians, he writes to his partners. It's a partner letter because in Philippians one, he writes in uh, verses three and four, Philippians one, three and four. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Jump ahead to chapter four and verse 14. It was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. Now, wait a minute. That's not good for Paul to have ministered in church after church after church and not one gave except the Philippian church. What about all the other churches? They failed their duty. They failed their responsibility to the kingdom of God and to the ministry that God had given them through Paul. Not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. That's a bad testimony against all the other churches. Where were they? Why didn't they give to Paul? Why did they neglect Paul when God had sent Paul to them and ministering the word of God to them that taught them and helped them to grow spiritually? Where were they when there was a need in his life? They failed. But the Philippian church did not. The Philippian church was the only church, sad to say, that's a bad testimony to all the other churches, but a good testimony for the Philippian church. That they had, he said, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. So you sent me offerings again and again. You sent me offerings again and again when I was in need Now, verse 19, and my God will meet your needs. See that if you will just connect verse, verse 16 to verse 19, you sent me aid, financial and material again and again when I was in need, verse 19 then, and my God will supply all your needs needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, there's a lot of Christians who try to claim Philippians 419 without practicing verse 16 and verse 15, 15 and 16. They haven't given, you know, you only have your needs met according to to how you have given into the work of the kingdom of God. Have you ever laid up treasure in heaven by giving to the kingdom work of God, the preaching of the gospel and the training of God's people. And so that you have a store that now when you have a need, your needs will be met. You only get Philippians 4.19 when you practice verses 15 and 16. That you give to the ministries and works of God 
when they have a need to build, to to go on radio, television, print books, whatever, and you give in those times that when you come to a time in your life when you have a need, God meets your need. You can only claim Philippians 419 if you practice verses 15 and 16, that you give into the work of the kingdom of God again and again and again, so that you are storing up for yourself treasure in heaven, as it says in verse 17, Philippians 417, not that I'm looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. Credited to your account, credited to your account. Have you put anything in your heavenly account from which God can now give back to you abundantly multiplied a hundredfold, 30, 60, a hundredfold back to you of his glorious riches in Christ Jesus? You need to store up by giving and participating and realizing it's a privilege, as it says in Second Corinthians chapter eight, to share in the kingdom of God. Now, I invite you to join us tomorrow at our service in the Denver Tech Center. Go to my website, 6.30 p.m. tomorrow evening. Be there. Join us for the word of God. And I invite you to partner with us in this ministry, Victorious Faith. Write to me at Victorious Faith, P.O. Box 1418, Castle Rock, Colorado, 80104. Or go to my website to give online. Join me next week. And remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.